This is the first video in a three-part series on distal upper limb blocks. In this video, we discuss the clinical indications and review the essential anatomy, which is fundamental to success. The indications for distal upper limb blocks are as follows. One, a supplemental anesthesia or rescue blocks for brachial plexus blocks that fail to provide complete surgical anesthesia. Two, secondary or selective analgesia of the forearm or hand for example, where short-acting local anesthetic is used for the brachial plexus block and then long-acting local anesthetic is used in the distal blocks to provide post-operative analgesia. Third, primary surgical anesthesia may be used if brachial plexus block is not feasible or to avoid its adverse effects, including unnecessary and excessive motor or sensory block. Preservation of independent movement at the shoulder and elbow can be beneficial for patient comfort and safety. In addition, certain surgical repairs may benefit from intraoperative motor testing by having patients make voluntary hand mo movements intraoperatively. This will be discussed in a later video. A good understanding of the innervation of the upper limb is essential to select the appropriate block to be performed and to locate and target the nerve to be blocked. Remember that for surgical anesthesia, we must anesthetize not only skin, but also muscles, ligaments, and other connective tissues as well as bone. Maps of territories innervated by individual peripheral nerves are much more relevant than dermatomal maps. Note, however, that these maps, no matter how pretty, rarely fit any individual patient. There is tremendous inter-individual variation due to anastomoses between adjacent peripheral nerves, overlap in terminal branches, and variation in branching anatomy. Witness the difference in median nerve territories amongst 10 volunteers in this study by Keplinger and colleagues. What was even more interesting was that in all subjects, there was always an area of the hand that was not innervated by any of the three major terminal nerves. With regard to muscles, ligaments, and bone, their nociceptors are generally innervated by branches arising from nerves that run in their vicinity. Thus, understanding the course of the peripheral nerves in the upper limb is essential. The upper limb can be functionally divided into the upper arm, forearm, and hand with the elbow and wrist as areas of transition and overlap. There are seven terminal nerves of the axillary brachial plexus that innervate the upper limb. The first is the axillary nerve, which innervates the shoulder and will not be discussed further here. We also have the muscular cutaneous nerve, the radial nerve, the median nerve, the ulnar nerve, and one that is often overlooked the medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve. This is usually located close to the ulnar and median nerves in the axillary neurovascular bundle. There are two other nerves in the upper arm, the medial brachial cutaneous nerve, which is the seventh terminal nerve of the brachial plexus, and the intercostal brachial nerve, which is an anterior cutaneous branch of the T2 spinal nerve. Both of these nerves innervate the skin over the medial aspect of the upper arm down to the elbow. Proximal to the elbow, the muscular cutaneous nerve gives off motor branches to the biceps, coracobrachialis, and brachialis muscles which flex the elbow. The radial nerve innervates the triceps which extends the elbow. The lateral and posterior brachial cutaneous nerves also arise here to innervate the cutaneous tissues over the posterior aspect of the upper arm. The median nerve and ulnar nerve do not give off any branches proximal to the elbow, but do supply articular branches to the elbow joint. Beyond the elbow, the muscular cutaneous nerve continues as the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve which innervates the cutaneous tissues over the lateral aspect of the forearm to the wrist and occasionally the base of the thumb as well. It emerges from the brachial fascia close to the cephalic vein, which is an important landmark. The medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve 
is the counterpart to the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve, innervating the cutaneous tissues on the medial aspect of the forearm and wrist. At the elbow, the radial nerve gives off the posterior anterior cutaneous nerve, which innervates the cutaneous tissues of the posterior forearm all the way to the wrist. Beyond the elbow, the radial nerve divides into a superficial and deep branch. The deep branch, also known as the posterior interosseous nerve, innervates all the major extensor muscles of the wrist and fingers. The superficial branch, also known as the superficial radial nerve, travels deep to brachioradialis muscle and emerges into the subcutaneous tissues just proximal to the anatomical snuff box on the lateral aspect of the wrist, where it innervates the cutaneous tissues over the dorsum of the lateral hand and thumb. Beyond the elbow, the median nerve travels through the forearm, sandwiched between flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus, and it supplies motor innervation to the major flexor muscles of the wrist and fingers. There are no cutaneous branches in the forearm. Proximal to the wrist crease and the carpal tunnel, the median nerve gives rise to a palmar cutaneous branch. The median nerve continues into the hand and divides into branches that innervate the lateral palmar surface of the hand, lumbricals, and thenar muscles. The ulnar nerve similarly travels through the forearm and innervates flexor carpi ulnaris and the medial portion of flexor digitorum profundus, again without giving off any cutaneous branches. Proximal to the wrist crease, it gives rise to two cutaneous branches that innervate the hand. There is a palmar cutaneous branch, sometimes also called the nerve of Henle, which innervates the medial aspect of the palm. The other is the dorsal cutaneous branch of the ulnar nerve, which innervates the dorsal aspect of the hand and fingers. The ulnar nerve continues into the hand to innervate the majority of the intrinsic muscles of the fingers. What does all of this mean for performing distal upper limb blocks? It means being clear about which cutaneous areas and musculoskeletal structures we wish to cover. Generally speaking, if we wish to cover the proximal upper limb to the elbow, one of the brachial plexus blocks is recommended, plus blockade of the medial brachial cutaneous nerve and intercostal brachial nerve if the skin incision extends into the medial aspect of the upper arm. An example will include ulnar nerve decompression or transposition at the elbow. For surgery of the forearm and wrist, I recommend blocking the median, ulnar, and radial nerve at the mid-humeral level to ensure that muscles and bony structures are anesthetized. The radial nerve must be blocked proximal to the takeoff of the posterior antibrachial cutaneous nerve, or this nerve can also be blocked separately. The lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve and medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve must also be blocked to cover the skin of the forearm. Finally, for surgery on the hand distal to the wrist, the median nerve and ulnar nerve may be blocked at the mid forearm level. The superficial radial nerve can also be blocked in the forearm, or if extensor muscle sparing is not critical, a mid humeral radial nerve block can be performed instead. Note too that the wrist is a transition zone of innervation, and thus depending on individual anatomical variation, blocks of the antibrachial cutaneous nerves may be required for complete coverage. For example, the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve, seen here as the dashed line, will often innervate the dorsum of the first web space of the hand. The simplest way to cover any patchy areas of cutaneous sparing is to perform subcutaneous infiltration of local anesthetic proximal to the cutaneous incision. This concludes the discussion on applied anatomy. In part two of this series, we will describe how to scan and perform specific blocks in the mid-humeral and anticubital area for anesthesia of the elbow and below. And in part three, we will describe specific blocks in the mid-forearm area for anesthesia of the hand, and how to provide motor sparing surgical anesthesia for hand surgery.